So today we're going to be talking about classification for MRI scans. So starting off, um, I'm hoping that you guys have all watched the segmentation video. And so for today, we're going to be talking about what exactly is classification. So the flow is exactly the same as the segmentation lecture video. We're going to start off by talking about what is classification in simple terms. Then we're going to go on to talk about its significance and its importance, and then onto the fundamental concepts before finishing off with the mathematical concepts of classification. So starting off, what is classification? In simple terms, it is the exact thing that you see on the board right now, or the image. We can classify these different points into three different kinds of labels. So in this case, it would be pentagons, circles, and stars. So classification has many different uses, and one of them that we would usually see is, for example, classifying into classifying our inbox. So something that is our inbox would usually see something that is important to us or something that we usually tend to see as non-junk and other things that are like spam fo folders. So this is like the very simple kind of classification where there's only two answers, yes or no or one or two. The other type is the multi-class classification as we see on the left side, which is exactly the same thing as the very first example that we saw. So for multi-class classification, it's more complicated or is more complicated than the simple yes or no or the simple this is a dog or this is not a dog. In multi-class classification as we can see we have many different categories or many different labels that these points can potentially belong to. So in this image it would be a happy smiley face, a neutral face, or a very unhappy or angry face. So classification, I usually see it as categorization. It's basically the same thing to me. And what it usually does is that it is giving segmented areas or segmented parts meanings to it. So we will see in an example later what exactly I mean by this, but this is an idea that I would really like you guys to kind of just remember and keep recalling to yourself, just keep saying it to yourself. Classification is giving segmented areas meanings and labels. So in more complicated words, uh, specifically for scans, classification is a means to organize all of the pixels in a digital image into different classes or themes. So what this means is that as we're looking over a MRI scan, a lot of the times they're pixels. So what we're doing is that we're assigning each of these pixels to a certain label or a certain class for us to be able to classify what exactly we're looking at or what exactly we're looking at in terms of our segmented areas if it's not a simple yes or no classification situation. And so applying to medical imaging as I was speaking before, remember that that phrase or that line that I asked you guys to remember, this is a photo or this is an image that was taken from the segmentation lecture, if you guys remember. And what I meant by giving segmented areas labels or meaning is in this case. So originally, this is the original image. And so after segmentation, what we would see is these three different colors. We would see the white, the dark gray, and then the light gray. And this is only the segmentation part to it. So you see the labels with the W, M, G, M, and CSF. These labels are not actually there when we only go through the segmentation process. But through classification, we're able to identify each of these three parts. So the whole point of classification is giving meaning to these segmented areas that we originally had, or giving meaning to the entire image itself. So another example of this would be a, a, a multi-class classification. So in this case, we can classify these different brain images or these different tumors into multiple kinds of uh, tumors. So as we know, tumors has different types. So for example, we can actually classify this into a glioma or a pituitary, depending on how we would like to classify these things. And this is what the entire classification algorithm is doing for us. They're able to read these images and classify these different kinds of tumors for us, potentially to even assist physicians. So going on to the significance or the importance of classification. So one thing that I would like to reiterate or to emphasize to you guys before we actually go into classification is the difference between classification and object detection. So a lot of times we mix these two things up because it's very, very easy to kind of mix up. 
So for classification, one thing that we need to remember is that we are categorizing the segmented areas. So we're not actually telling you where this where this image is or where this object is. So in this case, as you can see, there's just a tick with the dog there, which is stating the fact that in this image, there's a dog. So you can remember that Google image or that Google, that Google class validation part that we saw in segmentation. What it asks us to do is to click the images, for example, where cars exist in the images. Um, so in these kind of cases, it's classification where it's only asking us to identify whether or not an object exists within the entire image. Object detection, on the other hand, is classification plus localization. So the way that I would like to think about it is the fact that they would tell you exactly specifically where the, these dogs are or where these objects are in the entire image. And so it will tell you by pixels. And so going on, we can talk, we can see that classification can be applied to multiple areas and they're very, very similar to segmentation. So it can be classified or it can be, sorry, it can be applied to diagnosis, detection, and structure categorization. And we're going to see how in a second. So the applications and challenges um, to classification in each of these areas are, for diagnosis, as we said before, it's very, very time consuming. And a lot of times, one thing that we didn't know is the fact that it is also invasive. So when we're trying to classify or when we're trying to figure out whether or not a tumor is benign or mal malignant, a lot of the times we would have to use some kind of invasive method in order to identify these types of tumors. However, in the case of classification, this may potentially be something that we can get rid of completely. Another thing to note is that it is undetectable with the naked eye. So a lot of the times algorithms can help us pick up on things that we were not able to see in the moment or doctors were not able to see in the moment, potentially due to even just time constraints or just the fact that sometimes it's just way too small for us to actually see. And so these are the same things for detection as well. And going on to structure categorization, the challenges that exist in here is the fact that sometimes there are unnecessary tissues for diagnosis that we would just need to get rid of. However, we're unable to get rid of the tissues before actually identifying what they stand for. And so this is where classification may come in. Another part would be visualization difficulties. So if doctors or physicians are trying to look at MRI scans to identify places where they would like to enter or how they would like to perform their surgery, a lot of the times these tissues may get in the way of their visualization of the entire brain. And this is where classification may also come in. And so going on, the whole point of using classification and diagnosis and detection is the fact that it could potentially, uh, it can potentially identify a lot of these diseases during the early stages, which can actually prevent a lot of deaths. For example, for brain cancer, uh, for brain tumors, a lot of the times during early detection, we could actually take many steps, such as taking the taking the entire tumor out surgically in order to prevent any kind of spread. So any sort of early detection may even prevent death, and that's where classification can come in. Another impact would be the fact that we would be able to further assess the kinds of treatments or surgeries that would be required through our classified parts or through our classified tumors. Another thing which is the most important is the fact that this can assist doctors by saving time on analyzing a lot of these images. You can think of a doctor looking through hundreds of MRI scans and like potentially even eight MRI scans pay per patient just in order to diagnose some kind of tumor. So this is the very big thing about classification, the very, very big impact. And so another thing about it, as I reiterated before, is the fact that there are different kinds of tumor types, such as benign, malignant, and precarcinoma. And one of the things that we would like to know is the fact that there are three primary, tu uh, primary tumor categories for brain tumors. These are gliomas, the meningomas, and the pituitary tumors. And so one thing that I would like to know is that through a doctor's experience, a lot of times they're able to predict. For example, for gliomas, we know that they're commonly malignant. So combining this knowledge with the different kinds of tumor types, the fact that malignant spreads, so it's very dangerous to the patient, 
using these and categorizing or classifying the tumors with the MRI images, with the algorithm, what we're able to do is to assist doctors in deciding what kinds of treatments or what kind of surgeries that would be required for the specific tumors that we have classified. And so this can help the entire workflow or the entire process by speeding it up or making it more efficient for physicians. And so for tissue categorization, one thing that I'd like to know in terms of the impacts is the fact that we can figure out a means or a method for non-invasive pathological studies. So we're able to study, for example, the brain, the brain development or brain diseases just purely through looking at the MRI images. Potentially, we can even figure out information on brain development or the biomarkers that are related to brain development or even just brain, brain diseases. So a lot of the times, this provides us a non-invasive method for us to be able to further study um, details about the brain. Another thing to note is the fact that classification uh, or brain tissue classification provides seeds and masks for tractography and functional MRI studies, which is a different kind of MRI study, but tractography basically allows us to identify the nerves within our brains. And so it provides that mask. And so for tissue categorization, as I explained before, this is exactly what would happen if we're classifying a brain. What it does is that it gives meaning to each of these parts that we're talking about. So without the labels that we see on the side, potentially this would just be a blue, a green, and a white area. And looking at this, for a person like me, I would not be able to understand what exactly I'm looking at, what exactly is the green thing, because it's gonna be different from each angle. And what classification can help us do is to be able to identify or relate each of these segmented areas to a label that gives meaning for us to actually look at and interpret. So going on to talking about the current classification limitations, two things that I would like to note, which is very, very, which are both very, very similar to segmentation, is the very first part is image variation. So the variation within the MRI images, which can be a potential result of the sensors themselves or anything about the image quality, can potentially affect our classification algorithm. So that's a very, very big part. Another part to it is feature recognition. And so a lot of the times there are variations in data set. So the lack of generalizability in these, in these algorithms can make it very, very hard for us to be able to classify very efficiently. Another fact is the fact that tumor shape variation. Let's say that the algorithm learned we thought that tumors are usually round when we see them in MRI images, but a lot of the times tumors can grow very differently, especially when the tumors become larger. And, and at that point, it makes it very hard for the algorithm to be able to be like, hey, this is definitely a tumor, I know that. It is different from the way that our brains work as human beings. Another, th another thing to note is the fact that there are different methods of prediction and diagnosis for each of these diff types of tumors as we stated before. So it would be different for glioma or a pituitary. And we will see that in an example later as to how different kinds of diagnosis and predictions can make it very hard for us to classify or for us to be able to get a better understanding of what kind of treatments or surgeries to further use. And so as I stated before in the segmentation video, one thing to note is that there is no method that is suitable for all images and there is no image that is also suitable for all methods. So it's always going to be targeted towards our data set, which is a very big limitation in AI or in classification right now. And so as I stated before, for, fe uh, for feature recognition, this is exactly what I mean. So for each of these, as you can see, is a different diagnosis. So from A to H, these are all different diagnoses. And what, we would, what I'd like to know is the fact that a lot of the times doctors look at these images, they interpret the images, and then they go through the signs and the symptoms for each of these patients before actually making a good diagnosis or a good prediction. And that is something that the computer is not able to do for us currently. So it, the computer works completely differently from from the way that human beings think, which makes it a very big limitation right now, especially when it comes to feature recognition. So why is classification important? And I think this is a question that I would like to ask you guys um, after everything that we have talked about. So I'm gonna give you 
10 seconds approximately. So yeah, the colors on a digital image or the segmented areas are basically meaningless without labels. So with the help of classification, as I have reiterated and emphasized again and again, classification allows us to have some sort of meaning to the image that we're looking at. And that is very, very important, especially for someone who is looking at an image with zero background knowledge. So going on to the fundamental concepts of classification. So as a brief or a very overview of what classification workflow looks like, we have an input image, an MRI image in our case, that goes in and it goes through the entire pre-processing uh, parts or the pre-processing steps that we explain in segmentation video. So if anything, I would recommend you guys to look over that video first before going into this classification lecture video. And then after pre-processing, the output of that pre-processed image will become the input in the classification model training. So within this model training, what ends up happening is that we have this prediction that we're going to be talking about, this probability to a certain label that we're going to get. And using that trained model, what we're going to end up having is a very is a trained model where we would be inputting a different a different testing set into that for evaluation. And so what we're going to end up happening is that we're going to compare it to the ground truth in order to be able to find out the accuracy of our of our model as well as whether or not or as well as the classified image that we output. So going on to talking about pre-processing, I'm not going to go into too much depth as I explained before, so I'd recommend you guys look over the segmentation lecture video before looking at this if you want more information on pre-processing on MRI images. So I'm going to reiterate very quickly, the pre-processing steps that we usually see in MRI images include bias field correction, brain extraction, and registration, which is an optional step and it only exists if, for example, we have two different kinds of image modalities, such as MRI scans and CT scans. So I would recommend you guys to look, uh, to look more into this in the other video. So as a quick reminder of what we talked about in that segmentation video, bias field correction is basically this variation in the exact same tissue that we see. And then for brain extraction, what it basically means is that we're taking that brain out of all the other structures that we see in the MRI images and it can be different depending on the angle that we took the MR or the scan that we're specifically looking at. And as for registration, as you can see on the very left side, it is basically just having two images or two different kind of modalities and putting them or registering them on top of each other for us to be able to identify what we're looking at when we're comparing two different kinds of patients or the same patient but different modalities. So going on to model training, one thing that we need to know is that model training is the model learning to classify these images. And so the entire workflow for model training is as we have that Im input as our pre-processed image, which is going to go into our CNN, which is our convolutional neural network, which we're going to talk about later in the next slide. What ends up happening is that it learns to break up these images into different features. It recognizes these features and then it keeps it reiterating back into that model until it is trained, comes out fully connected layer, which is basically going to help us be able to identify the label to each of these pixels through a probability factor that we'll see later. And what we end up happening is a layer probability or a label probability that we'll see later on. And so this is a, this is a process that keeps reiterating until all the pixels are identified or all the pixels are analyzed. So convolutional neural network, CNN. This is a type of neural network that specializes in image recognition and computer vision tasks. So this is one of the most common methods used in, to classify images. Another one would be de a deep neural network, which I'm not going to be talking about in this video today. And so convolutional networks, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen, looks something related to this. And so this would be a shallow neural network, and this would be a deep one, where, as you can see, there are multiple hidden layers. And so we're going to talk about what each of these layers would represent or how the what the structure of this CNN would represent. And so two things that we would need to know about CNN is the fact that the convolutional mechanism, it breaks up the image into features for analysis. 
So you can think of the entire image going through this input layer and then into the hidden layers. So within these hidden layers, what you would see is a mechanism that breaks up the different features into smaller features for us to be able to analyze. And then the fully connected layer, which we'll see at the outside, which we mentioned very briefly in the workflow, is that it takes the convolutional mechanism outputs, as we see here in this output layer, and what it does is that it predicts the best label for the image. So this is based on the model that we have trained. And so one thing that we can kind of summarize CNN is, is the fact that it creates a mechanism for analyzing each feature individually, which gives meaning to the image as a whole. So the way that I would like to think about this is that the CNN is able to break things down into pixels for us that we would usually not be able to, that we would usually not be able to do as human beings as we see the image in its entirety and we analyze it all together. Whereas a computer has to break it into pixels in order to analyze each of these pixels themselves. And that is exactly what CNN does for us. And so this is an example that I would like to talk about in terms of how we view CNNs. So these, according to a human being, as we look at these two images, we know that we see two in each of these images. So we see the number two on the left side and we see a number two on the right side. But one thing that we need to know is that how do we see it? As human beings, we look at it and we're smart enough to be like, hey, we're analyzing this entire image it's, it all together and they both look like twos to us because of experience or because of what we've learned. So that training process of experience is basically what the CNN is doing. It is training itself to recognize what a two means. It's basically like a kid learning how to read a two. And so the way that I would like to see about is, is that this image on the left side is a very simple image of a two. So as a kid, the first thing that you would do is to show them this two to be able to learn what number two looks like. However, as we get older, we're able to add these different details or these arts to make it pretty. And what we end up seeing is this right image of a two. However, in order to recognize this image or this two, we require a lot more experience or we require a lot more analysis of the actual image. And that's where CNN structures come in. So one question that I would like to ask you guys, depending on everything that we just talked about, is what image would have a more complicated CNN based on the age reference that I just talked about? So yeah, the right image, this image that is more decorated, would require a lot more hidden layers for it to learn all these different features for it to be like, hey, this is a tooth that I see on the side, despite the fact that it has eyes and mouths on it. And so this is where the CNN structure comes in. And that's where the shallow and the deep CNN structure that we saw in that very, in the earlier slides. And that's what it represents when, it, when we're talking about a more complicated CNN. So going on to talking about the fully connected layer, as we explained before, what it does is that it takes the end result of the convolution process and reaches a classification decision for us. And what that means is we have that set of training, that input training set, and what it does is that it goes through this entire CNN that we talked about before. And each of these are just gonna be layers of just learning the features and extracting features, learning features, and what we end up having is this very last part, which is the fully connected layer of how many, however many nodes that we would, uh, that would be dependent on the complexity of our image. And what ends up happening in this stage is that a prediction comes out in order for our final output layer to be able to tell us what exactly this image is classified as or what object in this image is classified as. And so, the entire process with the brain MRI images, as I explained before, I just wanted to go through very briefly or very quickly as a summary of what I just talked about. So what we end up having in our situation when we're talking about brain MRI scans is that we would have a scan like this where you would not have that orange part, but it would just be a black and white or a grayscale image of that MRI scan. And what would end up happening a lot of the times is that we would, the algorithm would just identify where that tumor is specifically and it would enlarge on that in order to spit it in to this CNN for us to be able to train and study. 
And so what ends up happening after going through all this is that we end up having that fully connected layer as we talked about through flattening and all these processes that we'll explain later it would end up having this last prediction or this last probability score that would, that would allow us to be able to have our classification prediction for us to be able to analyze. So going on to talking about the evaluation, which is very, very similar to the inference in segmentation. So what it does is that we use our trained features in that trained model in order to classify images of data sets that have not seen that trained model or that model at all. And so the entire process of it is we start off by having our testing data set. So as I explained before, this data set has not seen this model at all whatsoever. So it doesn't know what is going on. And so going in, we go th we'd have our trained network as well, as well as our ground truth that goes in. And going through that entire trained network, we would evaluate the accuracy. So we'd calculate the model's accuracy. How well was it actually able to classify this entire image? And we're going to label the areas with that classifier. So what we end up having an output as is the loss value, so how accurate our actual classification model was, as well as our classified image. Is this benign? Is this malignant? All of that is where the classifier, the classifier comes in. So the accuracy metrics actually consist of a lot of different kinds. So there's two kinds that I would like to talk about as the basis, which is accuracy by percentage and confusion matrix. So we're going to go into deeper parts in the mathematical concept. So for percentage accuracy, this is a very simple math that we see a lot of the times, which is basically the number of correct predictions over the total number of predictions that are actually made. So one of the perks about this, or one of the disadvantages about this, is the fact that it gives us a false sense of high accuracy. And what I mean by this is, think of, an, think of a data set. And using this algorithm, we could potentially have, for example, 100 predictions that were being made. And we split it up into 60, 60, 40. And what we ended up getting was a correct, um, in our testing data set and our validation, uh, in our testing and training data set, we had 60 and 40. And let's just say that we had, a, or let's say 90 and 10. So for that 90, the accuracy would potentially be 90%. However, overall, the actual accuracy may not be that high. Um, and so it gives us that false sense of high accuracy. The other part to it is the fact that this method only works well if there are equal numbers of sample belonging to each class. So what I was talking about in that case was the fact that if we had 50-50, so 50 in class A and 50 in class B, we're able to use this to be able to get a better idea or a better sense of what kind of accuracy we're actually getting. So the confusion matrix is something that we use a lot when we're calculating the accuracy of our classification model. So things to note about the confusion matrix is, as we can see, this is what it looks like. We have the predicted no, the, predict the predicted yes, and then the actual ground truth. So that's where the actual is horizontally. And so what we usually see is that we call these things true negatives, false positive, false negative, true negatives. So these are very simple to predict or simple to interpret if you think about it. So true negative means that it is actually negative and it was predicted negative as well. So we would see that in the no, no section. And so false positive would mean that it was predicted as positive, but it wasn't actually. So the prediction would be yes, but in reality it would be no. And the same idea for false negative. So it was not actually negative. So it's falsely interpreted as negative because in reality it was true. And so and then there is also true positive. So one thing to note about this is the fact that we take the average values of the cr across the diagonal, which is going to be our accuracy as we see here. So it is a true positive plus a true negative over the total number of samples that we have. So in this case, it would be 165 would be our true total sample. And we would have our true positive and our true negative, which is 50 plus 100. So our overall accuracy would be 150 divided by 165. And so one thing to remember about this is the fact that this is the basis for all other metrics that we're going to see later in the mathematical concept section. So in terms of classifying labels, I wanted to go over this very quickly, which is basically the flattening process that I talked about. So what ends up happening is 
This is the probability that I was talking about with each of these features. You can think of each of these nodes as a, as a, as a neuron. So what we end up having is that each of these neuron or each of these features are given a probability. And so if it's 0.1, we know that it's going to be dog. So if it's in the lower section, we know that's going to be a dog because it means it's not as similar to a cat or it's not similar to a cat at all. So that means that it has to be similar to a dog in a case where an image includes a dog and a cat. Or, for example, if this feature had a very high probability, then we would know that it is very close or very similar to what a cat would look like. For example, whiskers. That's something that a cat tends to have that a dog doesn't. Going on to the mathematical concepts of classification. So first of all, we're going to learn how to analyze this image, which is actually very, very similar to the segmentation. So I would actually recommend you guys, as I said before, to look over that segmentation video before looking at this classification video if you want to get a better sense of how the computer analyzes the image before classification. So one thing that I would really like to know or like summarize, as I explained before, is the fact that when we look at a photo of an elephant, for example, what we see is this. So as, as human beings, what we tend to do is that we see this, and through training and experience, we're able to identify what exactly an elephant looks like, irregardless of what kind of angle or what kind of, what kind of lighting. So all of these is because of the features that we have learned that we relate to an elephant all the time. For example, a long nose. We tend to view that feature and say, hey, this is an elephant. So that's something that we've learned over time. Which is, some, which is a method of how a computer kind of classifies or learns the features of these images as well. So as we're looking at this image of the elephant, the computer different, looks at it very, very differently. What it tends to do is that for each of these pixels, for the digital images, for each of these pixels, what it tends to do is to assign a value to it and erase that value in order to understand this entire image. And so one thing to note when it comes to MRI images, as I explained before, look over a segmentation video if you don't understand this. But two things that we, uh, one thing that I'd really like to note is that for 2D and 3D images or 3D MRI images, it is very similar, very, very similar. What the difference lies in the vocabulary. So for example, for a 2D image, we refer to each of these boxes as pixels. Whereas for 3D images, we refer to them as voxels. And as you can tell, this is just a XYZ and an XY kind of situation. And that's the difference between analyzing a 2D and 3D MRI image. So talking about classification methods. So for, for these methods, it's actually a lot simpler. Um, I'm just going to talk about very briefly about the two methods that we tend to use. And so for the two kinds that we usually see a lot are supervised and unsupervised classification. So I'm not going to go too in depth in terms of the mathematical concepts behind these two, as I would interpret these two kinds of methods as more or less a conceptual understanding that you just need to understand behind this. The math behind this entire classification actually lies in the CNN, or the convolutional neural network that we talked about before. So a lot of the times in classification, we see these two kinds of methods. So for supervised, what it actually means is that classification is based on prior image or prior information. So what that means is that, for example, when we are learning a when we are learning a image of a cat, for example, what it would do is that it would extract the features or learn all these different things from a different model or a different image and be like, OK, well, these are all the features of a cat. I'm going to use this image and put it into my model and then train that model in order for us to be able to make a prediction with our own model. Unsupervised is basically classification decisions that are entirely based on the data itself. So what that means is that if I have a cat, let's just say the model's never seen it before, what it would do is that it would analyze the entire image of that cat and be like, OK, this looks like a feature. That looks like a feature. This looks like eyes. Through all this entire process, it would output a prediction that is not based on any sort of comparison with the ground truth. It is entirely based on the model and the data that is fed into that model itself. So no external kinds of validation, no validation from anywhere else. So going on to talk about the fully connected layer, 
So something that I would like to go in deeper, in deeper, like to give you guys a deeper understanding of what it actually is, is the probability assignment aspect to this. So as we have seen this image from previous slides, one thing that I'd like to note is that the output of the convolution is flattened into a single vector of values. So what I mean by that is everything before this flattening word is the CNN that we saw, like the entire thing that you would see in that depth. Um, so the, with all the hidden layers, that is everything before this flattening. So the output of that entire thing would be a single vector along this is what you're gonna be seeing. And each of these vectors, uh, the, the vector would have multiple values within it. And each of these values would represent a probability that a certain feature belongs to labels. So that was what we were talking about before here. So after all this stuff, you have that single vector and that flattening process allows us to obtain the single vector with different values. And so that 0.1 would mean how closely related is this feature to, for example, the dog or the cat that we're looking at. And adding up all this or through an analysis or interpretation of all these probabilities together, we're able to output what this image is. So if there are more 0.9s along this one, along this uh, single vector, then we would know that this image is more similar to a cat than a dog, and vice versa. If there are more 0.1s in this single vector, then we would know that this image is closer to a dog than it is to a cat. So that is the mathematical kind of concept or analysis behind how the entire CNN is able to identify or classify what the object is. And so one thing that I'd like to introduce to you guys is the idea of back propagation algorithms. So if you guys have read a lot about CNNs, and I'm pretty sure you guys would be a little bit more familiar with this term. And so what it basically means is that a lot of the times it is used to train neural networks, which is why I'd like to talk about a little bit with you guys. And what it does is that it goes through a set of these steps, which I'm gonna explain. Basically, for the weights are set for each of the neurons. So for, as you can see, this is the CNN that we're talking about. For each of these, it would be potentially a layer with these different circles as each neuron. And so in this layer, what ends up happening is that for each of these, we would assign a weight. So in this case, it would be weight one is assigned to neuron one. And inputs are passed through the entire network of neurons. So we see this entire process going through. So at each of these layers, a calculation is made. And through the entire thing, we would reach the very end. And what ends up happening with back propagation algorithm is that the network provides an output for each neuron and it goes, it works its way backwards by adjusting the weights of the neuron so that the results come closer to the ground truth. So what you can see as is whatever goes in was like the ground truth, what the original image was, right? And then through each of these layers, what happen, ends up happening is that we have the values continuously being altered until the very end. And so back propagation basically works its way backwards so that we're able to adjust the weights of each of these so that it is closer and closer and closer to what the original images were. And so how do we define this closeness or how does that back propagation algorithm determine what close means? And it is through gradient descent, as I'm pretty sure you guys are also familiar with, or if you're not, look over segmentation video again. Um, so by applying gradient descent to the error function, we're able to find the weights that achieve the lower error values. So what that means by is that at each of these weights, the errors would be minimized every single time. And so what ends up happening after using this gradient descent or this iteration process of decreasing or finding that minimum, the model gradually becomes more accurate. So that's something to keep in mind. The entire CNN through backpropagation and the embedded gradient descent method is able to minimize that weight so that we're able to achieve a more accurate model or a more accurate prediction. And so to summarize, the fully connected layer, basically it has its own backpropagation algorithm to determine the most suitable or the most accurate weight. So this is applying the entire backpropagation and the gradient descent concepts to the fully connected layer. How do those things tie in with our prediction or our classification predictions? And so after having each of these, uh, after the fully connected layer having its own backpropagation algorithm, what ends up happening is that each neuron received the weights 
that would pr prioritize the most appropriate label. So for each of these neuron, what it ends up going through is that it would go through each of these weights and it would choose or it would label it so that the most accurate one would be at the very top. And then the neurons would then vote on each of these labels. And the, the, the label with the most vote is going to end up being that classification decision that we saw at the very beginning. So we're talking about that line of values that I said before. So if there are more 0.9s, then we know that it would be classified as a as a cap because it has higher votes. There are more 0.9s, which means higher votes. So that's the entire concept behind fully connected layer or the mathematical concept behind how these predictions are made. And so going on to talk about the accuracy, which is basically the confusion matrix as I talked about before. So going in deeper depths, uh, in, in deeper, in deeper depths um, what we end up seeing is that for the accuracy me metric, just reiterating what we talked about for the Confucian matrix is that we see this, as you guys remember, and what ends up happening is that this is the basis for all these metrics that we see on the, on the right side. And I've only included two, because these are the two things that we usually commonly see in a lot of papers and a lot of the analysis, which is the area under curve, which is AUC, as you guys would probably see a lot of times, and the F1 score. So two things to note about the F1 score, or two terms that are very, very important to calculate the F1 score are precision and recall. And so the two, the two equations are stated on the left side, as you can see. And so what F1 score basically does is that it finds a balance between these two things. So we can see it as the higher the precision and the lower the recall, we have something that is very accurate, but it's not no robust at all. So for example, what that means is that if we have abnormalities in it, it wouldn't be able to adjust or it won't be able to recognize those abnormalities. So it wouldn't be robust in that case. And so this is the equation for the F1 score, which is basically two multiplied by one divided by one divided by precision plus one divided by recall. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to ask you guys is based on this is what, based on this equation, do we want a higher or lower F1 score? Higher. So same thing as AUC, we want something higher, always a higher score in order to have achieve a better classification accuracy. So higher means more accurate, always. And so uh, summarizing this entire workflow that we talked about, what we end up having is the MRI image that we see, and then it's going to go through that pre-processing method, um, and then it's going to go through that model training process, finding or learning the features, and then we're gonna have that evaluation process where we're able to have a testing data that comes in, where we're able to identify the accuracy of our model and whether or not or how or what images or what objects are classified in this entire image. Thank you.